Hi everyone, this is Andy from Med School EU, and we're going to continue on with the biology section of the IMAT specifications. And in particular, today we're going to continue talking about the cell. However, in today's lecture and in today's video, we're going to look at a specific type of structure called viruses. All right, first of all, let's talk about what is a virus. And a virus is a very interesting molecule. It is fascinating on how many di diverse different structures viruses have and how many viruses really exist in nature. It's, it's honestly just very, very fascinating to me. Now, if, if we're looking at a virus and what it really is, uh, there's been a lot of debate on whether or not a virus is really living or non-living. I mean, in this section, we're talking about cells and as the basis of life. So it is crucial to really talk about whether or not a virus is a living molecule or it is non-living. And this has been up to debate that is inconclusive still. However, the general notion is that viruses are infectious particles that uh, would infect a host cell or a host organism and use that host organism in order to exhibit life functions. So viruses on their own, if they're just floating around in the atmosphere or they're floating around or they're just sitting, they're like a book. They don't move, they don't fall, they don't walk, they don't metabolize anything. They're just kind of there, they just exist. They're just that genetic material that is encoded in a membrane and it just kind of sits there and exists and it's considered non-life. However, once this bacteria, this structure infects a host cell, it is considered life because it does reproduce, it does exhibit those basic life functions. However, it does need the host cell material in order to do that. Now, one thing we must mention is that viruses are very diverse, as I've said previously. And just to get an idea of how diverse viruses are, and a lot of them are really in the oceans. Viruses typically exist in the oceans. They're um, bacteriophages. And just to give you an idea, there are 10 to the power of 31 bacteriophages in the ocean. So bacteriophages meaning that these viruses specifically infect bacteria as their host cell. They choose bacteria as their host cell. Now 10 to the 31, that's a ginormous number. I mean 31, that meaning that there's 31 zeros after that 10. And considering that, there's just an enormous amount of viruses that are all different, have different types of structures and different types of genetic material, DNA, RNA, single-stranded, double-stranded, that exist in oceans and affect bacteria. Now there's a lot of viruses that infect humans and animals, and specifically just to give you an idea how many viruses there are uh, that are specific, that are different, that affect mammals, we've got 300, and this is a, an estimate, so 320,000 viruses, different viruses that infect mammals. So just to give you an idea of how diverse this structure is, and it's really very fascinating because we haven't discovered all of these viruses and they're, they're being discovered on a, on a yearly basis. However, it is important to know and it's just really interesting to see the diverse functions and the diverse structures of viruses. However, we're going to take a look at some of the common structures and their various forms and their key features. And we're also going to take a look at their most basic mechanism function once they do infect that host cell. So first of all, let's take a look at the structure. Now, as I've mentioned, viruses are very diverse and they have so many different structures However, we typically de depict the viruses based on three very common structures. Now, this triangular uh, structure that is outlined here, it's got a bunch of triangles, and it's, it's, uh, it encodes, it, it uh, surrounds this genetic material that I've shown here. So all viruses have capsid structures. Capsid. This one's called the capsid. 
and they also all must have uh, genetic material genetic material and genetic material could be in the form of uh, RNA or DNA or it could be uh, you know single stranded RNA double stranded RNA or single stranded DNA and single stranded um, and double stranded DNA so it could be all kinds of different genetic material that's encoded in this capsid and the last part, this, uh, this yellow circle I've got all around the capsid and around the general genetic material with these little projections here. And this one is called an envelope. Now, not all viruses have uh, an envelope, and we're going to talk a little bit more specifically which ones actually do. Not all, but it is a common feature of viruses. So let's talk a little bit more about each of these structures individually. So first we have the capsid. As you can see, this is the same one I drew uh, from uh, previously. And the capsid is uh, typically made up of proteins. And these, let's, let's depict how, how it is made and what this means. So it is made up of proteins. So we've got proteins. And proteins, they could be put together, so various proteins put uh, together, like, like so, in order to form structures called a uh, capsomers. It's called a capsomer. And typically capsomers, so they put together, you know, these capsomers, and these capsomers form together to form these capsid structures. Now what's important to know is that uh, a capsid, the, these proteins, are encoded by the virus genome. It's not encoded by, uh, it is not just taken away by any other host cell or any, or any other structure that's surrounding the genetic material. It is actually made by that same genetic material that floats inside. It is encoded by it. So when it does, uh, when it does exist in nature, these um, uh, these nucleotides are found within the virus's genome that would code for the proteins that make up this capsid. Now there's plenty of uh, forms, and there's just so many forms, and many that have not been discovered yet. However, we typically uh, classify them into three primary forms, and these are. Um, icosahedral, filamentous, and bacteriophage, which is which would be the head to tail, the most common one that everybody typically talks about. So let's take a look at these individually. Now the icosahedral structure is called an icosahedral because it has 20 faces. 20 faces. It has 20 different sides, so to speak. Uh, and that's just generally what I try to draw, draw here. And uh, that's called the icosahedral. That's this ball kind of 20 faces structure. And a lot of proteins are uh, encoded this way to form capsids that are uh, looking in this manner. Now next we have the filamentous structure. And as you can see, these proteins are formed in a... Uh, in a linear, thin, thread-like rod or, or helical shape, just like it, it's shown here. And all of these uh, little blue uh, molecules that are genetic material that, that is in, in com in, encoded inside of these. And the final one that is the most uh, most used in diagrams and most used in schools would be called a bacteriophage. Bacteriophage. And the, the general depiction why it's called a bacteriophage is because it infects bacteria. Now there's, uh, there's various structures to it. Now like we got the icosahedral. So this would be the head. We've got the filamentous structure, which would be the tail. Now this, the connection between the tail and the head would be called neck. And next we got the bottom here would be called the base plate. 
base plate. And finally, these little like spider-like projections, they would be uh, called the tail fiber. Tail fiber. And uh, a lot of these structures have their own names. You know, every diagram has their own names. But typically, what we would learn in, in high school is would be under these classifications. Now, the next one I wanted to talk about would be the envelope. And that's the yellow structure that I showed earlier with the little projections around it. And uh, the envelope is typically also just kind of like a membrane structure that surrounds the capsid and the genetic material. And it helps bind the virus to the host cell. So all of these little projections out here, these ones would be specific for the proteins that exist and the binding sites that exist on different uh, host cells. And that's why it would make a virus very specific for the type of cell that it would bind to. And another thing to note here about envelopes is that they're not coded by the virus's genome. And and why I say here that they're common in animal viruses, well, what happens with envelopes is that typically when a virus actually infects a host cell, it would enter the cell and it would reproduce. And once it exits the cell or lyses, it uh, unravels itself in the cell's membrane. So the membrane actually becomes the envelope for that cell. Isn't that fascinating how viruses are able to do that and this is why they typically exist in animal viruses because of the way that animal animal viruses have their uh, cell membranes and the way that they're laced by the viruses and uh, another thing to mention as i've said previously is that they have genetic material that floats inside here and that genetic material could be all kinds of dna and RNA, so single-stranded, double-stranded DNA or single-stranded, double-stranded RNA would exist inside and there's so many, so many different um, variations to that. Next, we're gonna talk about the mechanism of function. How do viruses go from being just kind of there, doing nothing and existing in the world, but without reproducing, without making any metabolites and without doing anything, they're just basically DNA or genetic material floating around with a protein capsule around it. So what happens is that these, the envelope or the capsid would attach to the cell. So the first stage of mechanism of function is the attachment to the host cell. So this would be the host and that would be the virus and it would attach with its projections onto the cell. Now the next thing that occurs would be the entry. So a cell would either enter on its own, uh, just like it's shown here, the entire cell, including the capsid, would enter, or it would sometimes just send its uh, genetic material inside. So we would inject its genetic material inside, which is, there's so many theories in, ter in terms of how each virus works and how the genetic material is actually inserted. However, that's just the general uh, depiction of it when the um, virus enters the cell. Right, so here we have another example where the virus does not actually enter the cell, but it injects its DNA inside here. And what occurs next is called gene replication. So this here, I drew a ribosome, I enlarged the cell. So this is not a bigger cell, the cell didn't blow up. But what happened is I just zoomed in on the cell to show you the, the replication mechanism that the cell uses. Now this genetic material that was originally injected by the virus, now you see the capsid is gone, and this gen genetic material uh, is going to use the host cell, so that's the host, the host cell machinery in order to reproduce and make copies of itself. So here we go. There's three copies now of the virus instead of just the one that we had at the beginning. The next stage would be the assembly stage. So once a lot of the viruses are reproduced, they assemble on just this one part of the, vi uh, the host cell and they assemble here. 
uh, and that's that's the next stage of the mechanism of function and next the final thing that we have is the viruses are released into the extracellular fluid bursting the cell and this release is actually called lysis and hence the name of this entire cycle is called the lytic cycle of uh, viral mechanism of function. However, the lytic cycle is just a general mechanism of viral injection and lysis. And not all uh, viruses function this way. I mean, some of them have different types of uh, mechanisms. And we're going to talk about a bacteriophage mechanism. So bacteriophage would be the one that infects bacteria specifically and bacteriophages have two types of mechanism of function the lytic cycle that i've shown previously and they have the lysogenic lysogenic cycle and we're going to talk about this one right here so the first two stages are the same the attachment stage and entry either by the virus itself or its genetic material that is injected so that's all the same now, if we're looking at the next stage, it isn't going to be a replication. It is going to be integration. So what I drew here is that inside the nucleus, we've got the DNA of the host cell colored here. And what's actually going to happen with integration is that this, the DNA or the genetic material of the virus will actually become integrated within the genetic material of the host cell. As you can see, the red part now becomes integrated within here. And what's interesting about that is it doesn't cause replication immediately, but it makes these structures that are integrated. And now this cell is just exists on its own as it used to be, but these parts are not uh, not yet activated and this molecule or this cell would then be called a prophage prophage and it's it's not active it's these genes are not expressed however the prophage is basically just a carrier of the genetic material of the virus that was injected in the first place so next what happens is cell division is normally the cell would go through stages of cell division and these things would replicate and as you can see what happens is that there's so many cells now that have this viral genetic material that is not expressed yet however it's there and it continues to multiply it's just in a different in a different way but these prophages are unnoticeably reproduced and the, the cell doesn't even know that uh, some of the genetic material is composed of the virus that's just how sneaky they are and what happens with this cell division is that over time with uh, the right conditions meaning that uh, there's a uh, uv radiation or you know the uv light uh, shining on the cell or certain chemicals can activate it they can trigger activation of these of, of this genetic material here uh, highlighted in red and the genetic material of the virus becomes expressed and what happens is the lyse, lysis activation the lytic cycle so the uh, again the viruses are made they're produced from these prophages and the cell goes through a lysis stage so just to recap there's the lytic cycle that all viruses generally go through and there's the lysogenic cycle that uh, is very specific to bacteriophages so this one would be with bacterio phages and that's the general depiction of how mechanism how viruses work and what is their mechanism of function and finally, we're going to take a look at some examples to show you uh, what viruses generally look like and some of the common ones that exist, exist in humans.
and what they really look like under the light microscope with a little bit of editing. Uh, so first here, this is one of the bigger viruses that uh, exist in nature, and this one is the HIV virus. As, as you can see, it's got, um, it's got an envelope. It's not just a capsid, it also has an envelope. And this envelope has these little projections, which would be the, uh, would help with the binding to the binding site of, of the cell, of the host cell or the host organism. The next, we have this scary one, uh, which uh, doesn't typically have this large envelope as the HIV virus. This one is called Zika. Zika virus and it kind of looks like a volleyball here with the with the protein shapes all around the capsid and this is this is a very scary one that we've had encounter with recently next we have the rotavirus and rotavirus is the common uh, stomach flu virus so this virus typically enters through fecal matter so uh, fecal to face if you didn't wash your hands properly, you would get this nasty dude in your intestines. And what they do is they kind of, they go into the, the intestines and they infect. So they bind to these cells and they disrupt all kinds of mechanisms. And they cause symptoms of a stomach flu with vomiting, diarrhea, because the, uh, the stomach lining and the, uh, intestine lining cannot retain water because the the material that's inside and all the cells that are inside are disrupted by this rotavirus uh, and because of its function to lyse to reproduce and continuously lyse however the rotavirus is typically not a deadly virus and our digestive systems are extremely good at getting rid of this one on their own and the final one that we're having big problems with, you can probably guess the name of this one. It's the SARS, SARS-CoV-2 virus. And that's, uh, that's the famous one that we're having trouble with right now. With that said, they would, it will conclude our video about viruses for today. And a lot of this information was gathered from KhanAcademy.org. So I wanted to give credit to Sal and his team for the content of this video. In the next lecture, we're going to take a look at the structure and function of cell membrane and the transport across the membranes.